this all came about is, is very different for me because I do a lot of genealogy with a lot of different people and names and places and, and I just love it all and it's hard to stay focused. And so one day I was sitting around talking to Angela and I was just telling her it would really be nice if we had some gurus that could help with certain areas, certain names, certain, you know, whatever of, of genealogy that we can, when we're trying to help other people or we're trying to help ourselves, we can say, oh my gosh, we really need to go talk to so-and-so. And so the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, this isn't a bad idea. And so um, sort of started reaching out to people, Rio Lobato in California, uh, Denise in Denver, Lorenzo, I don't know where he lives, Miguel Torres, Marietta's up in San Francisco. I mean, there's a ton of people that have pitched in and helped with this. It's, it's kind of amazing. When I just said, I think I'll work on Valdez because I have some Valdez in my family. Um, and you know, most people do a surname study because the name is unusual. Well, Valdez is not unusual. It's not. It's a common name, but it's unusual in New Mexico. Um, you know, how many lines of people have this in their family? I have two Valdez lines, and they don't connect. So, <laughs> my next question, they, they do not connect. Um, and I know some of you sitting in here have Valdez's that we all try to get to this trunk line, but we don't connect. And the other thing would be like historical occurrences of a name. So my husband's last name is Christmas, and so there is a group of people out there that study the Christmas name. Every time it comes up, even though we're not, they're not all connected, but it's a way to get people focused, and you, you can go to these people and say, you know, what am I missing? Where do I need to look? There is a guild called the one-name.org, and it's out of London. And if you are ever considering doing a one name, being a guru of a one name, this is a great site to just go get ideas. It's also a site you can join as a guild and they offer things to other people that do one names and they have a list of people with one names on their site. Valdez is not one of them. So, <laughs> so we can add that to that if we get to that point. But it's a great site and I've heard people from this society actually lecture on some of their families. So <clears throat> we have a the biggest other surname project in New Mexico is the Gurley site. And Angela Lewis, who's one of our board members sitting right here, she's what I call the guru of Gurleys. Um, she collects all Gurley names. She collects them from books, from places, restaurants, wineries. I've been all over the place with her, and if she finds the Gurley, we have to go drive to find them. So, <laughs> and that's what a one name study is. It's not just about your line, it's about all of the lines that can manage from that. So she has a Facebook page. This is their, oops, Facebook logo and then this is the website and on the website she has all the genealogy she has land grant information how to contact her uh, lineage stuff and that kind of thing and I've actually talked to her quite a bit about how she put this together um, with some hiccups along the way okay so these are my two Valdez lines first I have Juan Valdez who married Rafaela Gutierrez but not really um, they're coyotes, they live in Angostura, which is right over here by Algodones. They migrate to San Miguel del Bado. And in one of their kids' <clears throat> baptism records, it says Juan Valdez and Maria Rafaela Gutierrez, coyota, she's the coyota of Los Gutierrez, which is in Bernalillo, basically. They are not known, which means nobody knows how they got there. And they are hijos naturales, meaning they're both illegitimate and they're not married. This is my family. So I'm going, really, am I ever going to get this solved? Probably not. It's, it's just crazy. So I, I do live in Corrales, and so I do drive out to this area <laughs> just hoping I could find something, but that's not going to happen. My other Valdez is Juan Valdez, married to Teresa Martin. They married in Santa Cruz in 1743, and their witnesses were in Ignacio Valdez and Juana Martin. Now, Buxton states he's the son of Rosa Valdez using some land grant records. I think it's a little thin in terms of proof. I would like to see another document or another two documents that actually place him with her. Um, 
but I've left him connected because I can only have one disconnected Valdez at a time. You know, so <laughs> I might lose them. So, th you know, just kind of my story with the Valdez name. So collecting data, like all genealogists, we look at birth, marriage, death. Uh, we look at migration data, uh, places and dates, or dates and places. Uh, sometimes we look at occupations. In a lot of our early colonial records, we look at blacksmiths, we look at soldiers, um, those types of things. We look at court records, complaints, passenger lists, musters. So again, if you're considering collect, doing a surname study, you've got to think of all the different places that you might look to actually collect that name and put it into some form. So let's take a look at what we consider the Valdez trunk line for New Mexico. Um, and Origins of New Mexico, which we all use, is actually kind of a one-name study, except it's in a book. But it's by surname. We have a lot of data on specific surnames that are in the book. I mean, I think Chavez, if he had lived to be 300 years old, could have had a book on each one of the different surnames. So the other books we have are Spanish Recolonization, uh, the Diego de Vargas journals, uh, Biblioteca Nacional de México is at UNM, uh, Beyond Origin site that Jose Antonio Escobel has, or I even just looked on eBay and any books with the author of Valdez, uh, anything that might help me with my research problems. So uh, Fran Helico Chavez wrote that Jose Luis Valdez was a native of the city of Oviedo in Spain and 30 years old in 1694. And then he became a soldier in Santa Cruz, uh, and his wife was Maria Medina de Cabrera, a native of Mexico City. Would we all want to connect to this line? Absolutely. Why wouldn't we? They're a great family. We've got a lot of information on them. Um, he dies by 1703, and then they have some children, which is incomplete because we have some new information with more names on here, which we'll get to in a little bit. But he goes off to talk about that. Now, the last time Chavez updated this book, and I'm going to just pull it out of thin air here, is 1982, I think. So Origins is pretty old. I mean, it's not a new book that just came out with new research. So think about that when you're looking at data, when the book was published, because it could be fairly outdated. The other book that I think is also a one-name study book is Spanish Recolonization. When Jose and John Colligan put this together, they again did it by surname. So if you're looking for Valdez, there's a lot of information in that book on the Valdez family, their marriage, um, you know, start mining for data, um, and as I call it, drill down, you know, drill down into those records. Um, check against the source material that's available. You know, what if it's not sourced? You know, what if you go to look at the source and you can't find it? So think about stuff like that. And also think about maybe a geographic study of the Valdez name, um, like a place name. So because I'm from the Las Vegas area, maybe I would want to do a Valdez study of all the Valdezes in Las Vegas. You know, that just, just that down to that area so that maybe I can better understand how they got there, who they are, what family they come from. The other place I looked for uh, Luis, is in these books, the eight or nine volume set of the de Vargas journals. And in the back, the settle, Settling of Accounts book has a whole uh, summation of all of the indexes for the book. And here's some biographical notes. Do I want to go look at that? Absolutely. Uh, he was arrested. Do I want to go see why he was arrested? Oh, yeah. Um, he delivered letters for um, Diego de Vargas, rumors of reappointment, his salary and service. So I've spent a lot of time looking at all of the stuff that happened to this man during the time that Don Diego de Vargas was in New Mexico. And this is post, you know, reconquest time, so 1692 until Juan Luis died in 1703. Now I know he died because I found the, the death record and so I don't need to look for him anymore after that period because he really is dead. <laughs> He's not going to make another record. So I also started looking at land records, and I'm glad Edwina's here today because she's, her and I spent quite a bit of time going through land documents 
And I'll have this ready for publication or handout soon. Um, and it just, you know, he was part of the Santa Cruz de la Cañada land grant. He signed the document. And then the next time we see them with some land is not till 1739. That's a big time frame. So I think a lot of the family actually stayed in Santa Cruz and then some of the kids moved to Abiquiu area and actually had land there. Now they tried to move to um, what we would call Hernandez today, Chama, and boot out the Trujillos, but the Trujillos wouldn't stand for it. And so they went to the governor and said, get rid of these Valdezes, Los Valdezes, they're, they're not supposed to be here. Go give them their, other, their own land grant somewhere else. And that's why they end up in Abiquiu. Those of you that have not seen this book, again, it's dated, but it's Cañones, I call it the Cañones book, valuable stuff when it comes to Valdez people up in the Abiquiu area. And we'll look at that a little bit more. So I have like three pages of land documents. Um, they're all really interesting, some are boring, but pretty much for the most part, there's a lot of good stuff in there, a lot of good genealogy. And I know when Edwina and I were working on it, we're both approaching it from a different standpoint. We never found our ancestors in there. They're kind of hit and miss and back and forth, but just not really there. So here we have, if I was going to start this one name study, what I would do is I would start with what I consider the, the well-known family for New Mexico, which is, I put Ruiz, but it's Luis de Valdez with Maria Hernandez. And we know when they first came, they had two kids, Jose and Ana. We know that. So they get married in 1690. In 1693, they come to New Mexico. They get here in 1694. Then he's a witness for a bunch of marriages. He's one of the founders of the Santa Cruz de la Cañada land grant. Uh, more witness documents. He gets arrested, and then he dies at Zuni, Pueblo. So him and th two other guys from the Santa Cruz land grant were up at Zuni singing alabados, and they were killed. And um, he, he is dead. He's no longer living after 1703. I had, to, I had to tell myself that. So this kind of begins my little journey with these people. Uh, arrival and more children. So they have another child, Jose. There's Ana. There's Catalina, Lorenzo. I haven't found a birth date for him yet. Darn him. Uh, Francisco, Domingo, and Ignacio. So these are seven children. And I've been going back and citing all my sources for these people because I want to make sure that they're like real kids, like they're really their kids, what I'm using as the documents for that. And so here's the seven kids. After 1703, what does the poor widow do? I mean, she needs help. She needs something in her life to farm and do animal stuff and all the things that you have to do on a farm. So we know she's living in Santa Cruz. She keeps telling us in the records many times that she raised, raising seven children. Now this is a real clue, okay, seven children. We find another Maria de Valdez in 1712. She's a widow and has nine children. We, is this the same Maria? I don't know, because she doesn't go by Valdez. So I'm thinking this is not her. So who's this woman in 1712 in Santa Cruz? So we start throwing other names into the picture here of Valdez people. And I'm going to bring up Rosalia de Valdez. She claims she's a sister to Ignacio and uh, Lorenzo. Um, how is she their sister? The Medina woman, and is she really a daughter of Luis Valdez? And I think, you know, I jotted that down in a note, and I kept reading this over and over, and I think what she is is, is a sister, but I think she's a half-sister. I don't know that she's actually a daughter of Luis Valdez. Um, she's having kids too late to, to be that old. Um, and then the other question I have is, are there two Rosa Valdezes? And I ran this by Miguel uh, recently because one goes by Rosalia and one goes by Rosa. And it's kind of interesting when you, you know, you're trying to keep these records together. Um, is that enough of a distinction to think that there might be two Rosa Valdezes in the same time period? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but it's something to think about. So here we have our guy uh, linking the families. 
figuring out how they all fit in together. I've been using a, a genealogy program uh, because I can't keep track of people very well. I use index cards for a lot of stuff, but I can't even keep track with my index cards. So I've gone back to the program. Um, Angela uses a different kind of numbering system. I mean, I think there's a way to keep track of, you know, I'm Valdez number 243 or something like that when you're starting to go in through that. There's also maybe a way to do it by geographic area. We know there's a lot of Valdezes up in Abiquiu, so maybe you have an Abiquiu family, number one, or Santa Cruz family or whatever, but you know, it could be down to that level. It just kind of depends on how, if you're gonna do this kind of a study, how you keep them separate, and then how you put them into family groups, and of course the big thing is we want them all to connect, right? That's why we're all wanting to know how we all connect. <laughs> but sometimes they don't connect. So it's really important to actually think about, you know, the disappointment of doing something like this and then not really being able to get it all done at the end. You're gonna have some pitfalls. And this is Jose Luis Valdez's signature with his rubric here in the bottom left corner. Um, that's, he signs all the documents the same way, so I know it's him. Um, but he died in 1703. I just keep saying this because <laughs> So let's just take a look. Well, let me go back one. So this is what I have on him. My pointer's not working too well. We have him, I have him as a sergeant, born about 1664, died 1703, his wife, his parents, and the seven children that we keep talking about or just keep getting mentioned constantly. So um, I haven't put a number with him or anything yet because this is still like a floating fluid project. I haven't quite gotten there yet. So the first son that I have is Jose Valdez from, you know, lives mostly in Santa Cruz. He was down in El Paso, according to origins, married to Michaela Lucero de Godoy after she passes on, and it appears that they did not have any children. I don't, haven't ruled it out yet, that he only had one son who we know as Juan Francisco Bustos y Valdez with Josefa Bustos Ontiveros. Now, I'm going to just say this kind of tongue-in-cheek, but I don't trust her. <laughs> so I don't know if he's the real daddy baby or somebody else's. And we'll get to that later because we have conflicting DNA evidence. So, you know, he's their only son, but there's a lot of Valdezes that come from this family. And so they're good to take a look at because I think they do tie in somehow. So the, there's our little Francisco. So then we have Anna, who married uh, Lázaro Antonio Córdoba. So her children would be Córdoba y Valdez. Um, he, she dies, he gets married again, has more kids. Um, but there's a bunch of Valdez descendants that would be Córdobas, basically, that I think are, again, part of this project because we're still doing DNA on this Córdoba line, too. And so we kind of have to see how it all plays out. So on this one, a land document that came out was uh, in 1712, Lacedo's asking for his wife's dowry. Okay, I want that land you said you were going to give me because I need it to plant corn and wheat and tomatoes and my salsa and all that stuff. And so part, part of this document is really good, but again, we have seven children here. This is the mother saying, I have these seven children that this property is going to be divided amongst. That would rule out Rosa. And it, for many reasons, it will rule her out. But law, the law is one of them. So again, we kind of take a look at this and see that seven word. We have Catalina. Um, she gets married to Miguel Lujan. Uh, he quickly kills her, murders her, gets put in chains, sent down to Mexico City. He uh, escapes. Um, and he does come back. Uh, she, but, but even the mother, Catalina's mother, Maria de Cabrera, <clears throat> states that their life was not harmonious. Now, the guy that took Miguel down to, to Mexico City was his uncle, a, a uncle-in-law. So, you know, he escaped, really. Like, did he escape? Like, he left the chains loose? I mean, <laughs> were you helping the guy out? That type of thing. So we don't have descendants from her that we know of. 
um, never stated in any of the testimony for his court case that there were children. So we can kind of rule her out. Then we have Lorenzo, who is in Santa Cruz, Abiquiu, and does get a land grant. Per the land grant records, we know that there is a descendant named Julian Valdez who marries Margarita Velarde. We don't know who that link is right there. And then the other link is Manuel Valdez, um, which could be something interesting in terms of true identity to, to the family and the DNA and all of the stuff there. He does sign his name very similar to his father, uh, so that's a good clue. Um, but a lot of, just doesn't have a lot of kids that I can find so far, which is unusual in New Mexico. You know, you don't marry a Salazar and not have 14 children. It's just not done. I mean, there, there's got to be some missing people there. So we have another, well, Francisco, who's in Santa Cruz and Santa Fe, who marries the Benavides lady. Now, he's got Alejandro Valdez, but these are all the Santa Fe people. Uh, Francisco, Manuela, Antonia, Lucia. Uh, he had a previous wife. I have not been able to place any children with her yet. Um, but this would be my Santa Fe, there's a bran two branches that are off in Santa Fe in terms of the Valdez people, and I think it's kind of interesting to note that they're soldiers, they're land grantees, they're doing something different in Santa Fe. I don't know why they didn't want to stay in Santa Cruz. Nothing has told us that in this study of the name itself. Um, but I'd like to get some DNA from his line. And then we have Domingo, the soldier brother who's in Santa Fe, Santa Cruz, and his land grant is actually where the Indian school in Santa Fe is today, so um, that area. He's got a lot of kids, again, all in Santa Fe. They don't really mingle with their cousins back in Santa Cruz too much, um, but he does not spell his name like his father. He does a B-A-L-D-E-S, which is interesting, so I don't know if that makes any difference or not, but the records tell us that he is their son. And we have Ignacio, um, who's one of the land grantees with Rosa and Lorenzo. Now, he's got a lot of kids, but they all die young. A lot of them die as babies. So there was something wrong with one of them. You know, these kids just did not live. Um, what's interesting, though, is that this couple does stay in the Santa Cruz Abiquiu area. And so it's worth taking a look at. The problem with the Valdez is they all name their kids all the same thing. Manuel, Antonio, Lorenzo, Luis, Francisco. I mean, over and over and over again. They even do it with the girls. Manuela, Lorenza. I mean, it's just a, you know, it's like crazy, but it just happens. So you kind of have to kind of take a big look at all this. There's a lot of Domingos in the family. I mean, there's, it's, it's hard to kind of put them in place sometimes. So there's other Valdez lines. There's a Gregorio Valdez that was here pre-revolt. He was with Otermine when, when they were shoved down to El Paso. He's in Santa Fe. He, on his testimony of September 18, 1680, he was an Awasil Mayor. I mean, he had a place in the town council. He says he's married with two sons and a little girl and an Indian servant. Who the heck is he? And we have Gregorios in these other lines, and so it's kind of weird, because I'm thinking, did he come back? Did his children marry in El Paso and bring some of those kids back? I don't know. I don't know who he is. We have a Luis Valdez in 1717 that, this is an unusual marriage record anyway, but it's for Mar Marcial Rodriguez of El Paso, who's living with the governor at that time, with the Juana Mendez, and this guy would have been born in 1691. Who is he? Another Luis. Is he a cousin, a brother, a dis maybe from the Gregorio guy? We don't know, but who is he? And what's he doing in our records? You know, you start finding these people and going, did he leave children? And he's hanging around with all these people from um, Santa Cruz. Then we have a Nicolasa Valdez de Cervantes. This is Miguel Quintana's wife. And it's kind of interesting, but when you start looking at her and the Quintanas, 
the Valdez, let's just say the Quintanas with the Valdez main trunk line, they're living close to each other quite a bit. So is there a connection with Luis Valdez and her as a Valdez? And we just don't know it yet. But he came with the reconquest like Luis Valdez did. And they're the ones that live next door to this Maria de Valdez that we can't place. But she does use her Valdez name quite a bit. And again, does she have relations with, with our Luis Valdez that came to New Mexico? And then there's my grandma, Rosa. <laughs> or should I call her Rosalia? I haven't decided yet. Uh, she's in Santa Cruz, she's in Abiquiu, she gets a land grant. I consider her a new Valdez family, even though I think she's a half-sister to Ignacio and Lorenzo. Um, she has a son, Francisco, a daughter, Michaela, Miguel, Salvador, and my Juan, the, the bold one, uh, Juan Bautista, and another Juana Michaela. Now these people are fairly tight in with the Martin Serrano family. And they fight each other, they're fighting over acequias, they're fighting over fences, ditch diversions. I mean, you know, if there's a way thing to fight about, it's like, you know, oh, we haven't had a fight this month, let's go find something to complain to the governor about. So the nice thing about that is they left a long trail of a lot of documents. I mean, back and forth, back and forth. And all the documents say that Rosa and her two brothers, Ignacio and Lorenzo, they're in the thick of things. I love Rosa. She is landed, she's smart, she knows what she's doing. When she asked for the land grant, the governor gave her more land than her brothers. And he kind of teased him and said, because she had the guts to come and ask for the land, she gets more than you guys. And I'm going, go oh, Rosa. So, <laughs> so you have to consider some of this stuff. Is my Juan Valdez one of her sons? I still don't know. I, I just don't know. But I'm leaving him there for a while. So I'm considering her her own persona at this point. We have the two biggest ones are RM269 and EM183. We don't know. So we need other people to, to test. My, my gut feeling is I think we just need more tests. We, don't, we have a lot, but we don't have the right ones. We need lineage with good documentation that goes up and down the line. So what do you do with no matching DNA things? You go back and redo your genealogy with primary documents, which is what I'm in the middle of doing. Um, look at the records to see if there's a baptism missing. Maybe they were a criado, maybe they were adopted into the family. You can't find a baptism record or a really good marriage record. You have to kind of consider some of that stuff because that's just part of our cultural practices. You have to consider adoption. We didn't have a formal adoption process back then. I mean, they just brought kids into the family and they took the name. They could be illegitimate. So my rule is if the kid has the same last name as the mom, you have to kind of really think about they might be illegitimate. I mean, you just it's hard to find a Valdez Marina Valdez, there is one couple that did that. Um, or criado criadas that come into the home. Um, it, there could be many more reasons. I mean, I'm, this is a not all-inclusive list. Um, so if you're going to use DNA as part of like your surname study, I think again you have to figure out how you're going to use it and how you're going to validate it and how you're going to reach out to people with that information because you know, the minute you start talking DNA and you, you don't match, you both look at each other like, well, I'm from the real line. <laughs> you know, you're just like, who are, who are you from, you know? So people get all defensive and crazy and stuff. So, you know, consider it. And it's on sale right now, I think. So Valdez place names. I have to tell you, I'm a little disappointed with Julian on this one. Um, Look in place name book books. The Valdez that he cites on here is at the Towski Valley. And he says that it's by, you know, named after Luis Valdez. Well, there's no way that Luis ever went to the Towski Valley during the time that he was in New Mexico. Um, maybe he passed through there, but I don't think they named it that. And it's really Arroyo Seco, which is not really formed in Taos till like the 1800s. So, I you know, John, you're shaking your head. It's 1820 or something. You start finally seeing the Valdez, Arroyo Seco name there. So 
this is, I think, a wrong entry. I think the Valdez that's Valdez in Taos County is probably named after somebody else, and, and that could be its own little Valdez study group because I think we need to figure out who this guy was that started this little town, and they need to fix the book. Uh, there's a Valdez in Colorado named after Gabriel Valdez, who homesteaded there in 1900. Um, if you ever go up I-25, hang a left at Trinidad, you can get to this Valdez. Is that part of our study? Maybe. Maybe not. Um, but it's interesting, and it's in, in Los Animas County, if you don't know where that is. Um, other things I've looked at, I did go look at Valdez in Spain. I looked in you know, Val Oviedo, and see if I could find place names of streets. I mean, anything that would just kind of play out with more information with this stuff. And, and so it's been kind of a, a fun task. But this, this is not from this book, okay? This map is from Cañones' book. And those of you that are going to even do, I would just say, the Martin Serrano project or a Valdez project, there's other families up there also. They have some great maps in there, and this book was put together by some anthropologists, and so they have a lot of data in there, and they have family groups too, so it's really kind of a fun book to look at. It's dated. Now, and Eladio Luna did a Joaquin de Nascimento land grant where he mentions Rosa on many, many, many pages. Great little book. Um, this one's at the main library. This one, I think you can still buy it. Um, this one has a separate index because it's not indexed, the book itself, so you have to look in this other book to get to the index. But the maps have been really helpful for me. So here's where Rosa lived with her family here in this Cañones area. You see where it says Merced de Valdez here? Merced meaning land grant. Um, here's that mountain, here's that mountain range. Um, they lived right in here, isolated, far, uh, somebody told me there's some really good documents in the Pedernal um, land grant materials. I haven't found it yet, so that there might be more about those people there. But you kind of look at some of this and you go, oh my gosh, you know, this is, this is to Youngsville over here, Coyote, all these little place names. The Juan Jose Lovato land grant has stuff on the Valdezes in it. Uh, Polvadera, I think, has some. So Piedra Lumbre has some. So all these surrounding places for Rosa, if you're interested in her, you have to look at about eight different land grants to be able to kind of get enough detail about her. But this is a neat Google Earth map. Um, you can kind of just even get down to ground level to see the houses. So left, left to do is to do more DNA testing. So if anybody in this room has a clear title to Luis Valdez, see me because I will pay for your DNA test. Um, I got to find a way to publish the data so I can get that out to everybody. Probably it will be in the newsletter. Um, I still have a lot of stuff to proofread and connect and stuff. I'm still getting a lot of help from people. People are sending me a lot of Valdez stuff um, and it's all appreciated but I've seen a lot of it over and over and over again. Um, and I need some new ideas. I mean, maybe other ways to look at this, how it can fit into our lives. If you want to start your own Valdez project, I would gladly give you all the material. It's right here. You can take it. Um, do I need to do more genealogy? Absolutely. And I need to break it down by family groups or generation levels or towns or something because it's just getting a little unruly to deal with. Um, how come I don't connect to the main trunk line? You know, you got to be able to just come up with a good, solid answer why. Um, or they're just starting their genealogy. This is the one I love. Can you send me everything you have on my Girl A family? <laughs> um, and do you want to answer questions? So that's the other part. If you want to do a one-name study and you want to be like the expert for this one person's name or an area or whatever, do you really want to spend time answering your questions? Because um, Angela spends a lot of time and it kind of comes and ebbs and flows in terms of answering questions and so think about that. Uh, publish, like the Girl A site has a website, they have a Facebook page, she's done some articles. I think I kind of prefer the just email out mass mailing to people which you can do real easily with a uh, Gmail account and stuff like that. Uh, there's other things that you can do a blog. 
Um, but I think it's important to share the data because everybody has stuff. You know, one person cannot have it all. Um, there's people that are going to be from Penasco or Mora or Tremontina or wherever, Socorro, and they're going to have stuff that you don't. You cannot be in all places at all times. The pitfalls is it never ends. You know, the research, I mean, we're all crazy, right? We love the research part. You're not going to connect everybody. I've worked on my family for over 35 years now, and I have a lot of ends that don't connect. Um, you won't make some people happy. I mean, your research, you know, you spend hours and hours and time and time and days and turn into weeks into months, and people just get upset with you. You know, they, they can connect willy-nilly, but you're worried about it. One of the things that's bothering me right now is my system isn't working. My data gathering, how I'm putting it together system, um, and so I need to work on that. Um, am I burned out? Not really. I love this stuff too much to get burned out. <laughs> I might have to put them to rest for a week, though. And, you know, kind of bridging some of these impasses, I think, is a bigger, bigger deal to get people to help you work on certain lineages or whatever that you can actually add to the, the bigger cluster of the family. Um, so I'm going to urge all of you. We have a very unique state. We have rooibos all over the world come from New Mexico. Mestas come from New Mexico. Archuletas come from New Mexico. So we have some really unusual names in our state that they're nowhere else. Gourlays come from New Mexico, believe it or not. So, you know, if you want to start a study, a group, an interest group, uh, there's a lot of names to choose from. I would suggest start with one of your, the ones you're most familiar with. Uh, and tell us when you do it, because we'd like to help, we'd like to advertise, we'd like to put you on our list to answer questions. Um, I think it can get into something a little bigger than what it is now. You know, we, we have some nice books, we have the Gurley site, and I think we can add some more to that. Um, and I'm just always looking for ways to reach out to the general public. I think it's, it's something that we do as a genealogy society. And again, just a way to say, you need to go talk to so-and-so. And I think people appreciate that. So with that, I am done. Are there any questions?